So I am Todd, hailing from Halifax, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have the opportunity to actually present with Leland, because of course he and I are in the back room having this conversation all the time. So it's great yes. to have an opportunity to actually present together. So Leland, do you sure. just want to introduce yourself for a second? Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Leland. Um, yeah, here today from my office in Dalhousie University in Halifax. We don't have any snow here today. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so I'm going to present first to give you an overview, and then Leland's going to fill in terms of some examples from his clinical practice and 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 how he uses this kind of safety and repair approach. Uh, and it's really it's a three phase model for uh, or approach to dealing or attending to gender based violence. So he'll give some examples around that. So just by way of introduction uh, with myself, so I've been working in rural Nova Scotia and Truro for uh, since the early 90s, specifically primarily working with guys who use violence against their partners, uh, their female partners. Of course, the work is way more complex than just men's violence against women, you know, which which the um, you know field has moved into. And if I could unpack more of that and had time, I would. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be primarily talking about men's violence against women, but recognizing that we we're working, you know, in a same sex queer context all the time and and or you know situations where women you know uh, per perpetrate abuse in relationships so i just want to make that those pieces of the work visible uh recognizing that you know the examples i'll be drawing on are, will be primarily around the men's violence against women uh when we're i was trained initially by the people who put together the power control wheel I presume that people are familiar with that in this context um but uh Michael Paymer, Alan Pence. And uh, that work remains important to me in terms of situating the work in the community uh, context, coordinated community response, focusing on social uh, forces like uh, sexism as, a, as influencing people's choices in these relationships and contributing to domestic violence. Uh, some of that work was uh, unhelpful uh, over time. I was really trained into being oppositional with the guys that I work with. So we recognize that many men come in with minimizing the seriousness of the abuse, denying the abuse, or um, or uh, blaming it on other people. And many of the men that we work with are mandated to be there. Uh, and um, so we knew it was important to address those that irresponsibility the men were coming in with. We, I was trained to really be confrontational and oppositional with that. That just proved unhelpful over time. It, I got introduced to, uh, so that's the Duluth model. I got introduced to narrative therapy and some of Michael White and Alan Jenkins' work. And that really uh, showed me how to keep the politic and the responsibility intact uh, and the importance of accountability and do that in a way that was still compassionate and therapeutic towards the men. Like in the early days, I thought I had to be hold the men accountable and responsible i had to, and i had to be tough on them and confront them and i've just found much more over time that um actually the terrain that the men are least um familiar with is safety that that's actually what's confrontational for them to have a space that they could actually feel respected enough to actually face the violence that they perpetrated you know and that they didn't feel like i was going to attack them and that that could let them struggle with their own values and ethics around the abuse that they've they've um, uh, engaged in. So um, that's just a little bit of my background. And of course, trauma work is part of this because we're dealing with violence. And then more recently, thinking about the language around restorative justice and finding that helpful in terms of framing the work. And part of what I mean by that is that uh, the focus of the work, the kind of the top note is about both stopping abuse, creating safety, and also repairing harm. And so when I'm talking about repairing harm in relationships, I want to be clear on restorative justice. I'm not talking two things. I'm not talking about uh, necessarily restoring an intimate relationship. That may happen or may not, but there's lots that can be, I'm really talking about repairing harm. So there's lots of harm that can be repaired, even if a couple is not back together. Repairing harm could be, uh, you know, often... I think often in the early days, we just thought that these the only thing that needs to happen is these two need to separate and go their own way, <clears throat> which is generally not what happens. Usually they're sharing children. Usually they live in, in our context in the same small community, so they're going to be seeing each other. So they're built, there's still possibilities, lots of possibilities to participate in repairing harm. 
um, even after a relationship's over. And repairing harm in that context might mean, you know, financial payments or whatever, but it also could mean just respecting distance. That could be part of the plan in terms of repairing harm in, in, in the relationship. So it's not, again, not about necessarily restoring intimate relationships. The other thing is, it's, in terms of restorative, it's also not about circles and getting people in circles and getting people face to face. That's not what this is about. This is about creating people's capacity to repair harm in relationships, both when they're hurt and when they've hurt other people, to be able to repair harm with the person that hurt them and also repair harm with the person that they hurt in a way that doesn't create more harm. So that's the principle that we're holding on to in the work is that how do we repair harm? How do we as clinicians help repair harm without creating more harm? And how can the, the woman and the man, if that's the configuration, how can they actually repair harm without creating more harm, both when they're hurt and when they've hurt other people? Uh, so I just want to move to, this is a very fast run uh, in terms of this workshop, but how about, I'm going to share my screen with you, um, just to show you the model in terms of this three phase model. Um, okay. So can people see that? Okay. Is that looking good? Looks great. Okay, thanks. So there's a three-phase model. So what, what you have here is two inverted triangles, you can see. And Leland was instrumental in kind of uh, giving a visual uh, for, to describe this work. That's been very helpful. Um, the, so there's two triangles upside down here. And this is representing two people coming through the system. So at, at Bridges, uh, we always work with both people. So both partners are coming through the program. They both have their own individual therapist and they're going through these three phases. One is first establishing safety. So of course that's about, you know, the violence stopping. It's about attending to somatic work and so forth. And also the social determinants of health uh, too, because we know the social determinants of health, like poverty and housing and access to education and so forth. Are, well, they're the social determinants of health. They're also the social determinants of violence generally and specifically family violence. So we want to be attending to both the clinical issues at play, the physical safety in terms of both parties. The, so they're separated. You can see how the, um, the uh, representation of the two paths is that they're separated through phase one and phase two. And then may, there may be communication in phase three, which I'll explain more in just a second. But First, it's about that stabilization and, and uh, creating safety in phase one. Then it's about preparing both people how to re repair harm and relationship with the person you hurt and also with the person who may have hurt you uh, or who hurt you and how to do that in a way that doesn't create more harm. That kind of preparation, there's a lot of focus in that and looking at how both unhelpful gender ideas end up impairing people's ability to repair harm in relationships and distort ideas around repairing harm or even prevent people from noticing repairing harm is even possible. Uh, but also looking at how often ideas that stem from trauma, unresolved trauma, can also um, impair people's ability to repair harm in relationships. Uh, so I can unpack more of that as I go here too, but just the, um, for example, it's pretty common for when a guy's using abuse for him not to actually be coding what he's doing as abuse. There's many reasons for that. One, he, so he may be thinking of his abuse as uh, anger, which is just common, you know, so a lot of the template the guys come in with is, you know, if they come from abusive backgrounds, is that, um, you know, that anger and yelling are synonymous. So when I, we're asking them, so how would you prefer to express your anger in relationships? Guys are often pretty confused by that question because they think there is no other way. This is just anger means. And so they come in thinking that they're joining an anger avoidance course or something. So there's lots of issues there in terms of uh, preparing guys and attending to ideas that stem from, from uh, trauma. I want to be clear. I'm talking about trauma and looking at how the, how those ideas can 
impair guys' ability to take responsibility. I'm not at all suggesting that because people are beaten up in their childhoods that they necessarily, I'm not suggesting a linear causality between that and people beating people up in their adulthoods any more than I'm also not suggesting that it's appropriate to reduce this issue to just being a man. And that's why they abuse, you know, that of course there's other in intervening things, you know, so masculinity is one of the uh, ideas that's influencing these guys to choose abuse in relationship, but, and there are also other experiences so there's other mitigating experiences that happen. So again, not every guy goes on to beat up his partner. Well, not every guy um, is, uh, you know, who's been traumatized in childhood goes on to abuse his partner too. And do I think that it's at the same time is significant, the fact that 95% of the men, especially the really dangerous ones, I've got horrendous experiences of childhood. And do I think that's influencing them in the present? I, I do. You know, and that, but it's not linear. There is an interaction between unhelpful ideas around masculinity and trauma that I'd love to unpack more. But, and if people are interested, I've written some on that and, and uh, I can send that to you if you're, if you're interested. I want to move to phase three, which is practicing actually repairing harm in relationships. So we have a whole criteria worked out moving from phase one to phase two, phase two to phase three. And when I'm talking about practicing communication repair in, in uh, relationships, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily face-to-face. -face. Actually, most often it wouldn't be that, you know, because you can just see it. There'd be all kinds of circumstances where that might actually create more harm. And so part of what we're actually doing is uh, communication may happen just between the two counselors. So the two counselors are in contact right away to address issues of safety all the way through. So the counselors are talking with each other throughout the three phases. And maybe the communication that's going to happen at fair phase three to repair the harm, it's only going to happen through the counselors. Maybe it's going to happen through letters, through video, or in person. And that's going to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. We're, this, this is not a cookie-cutter approach. Further, we do not no, but we're all, we're only going to communicate in a way that's not going to create further harm. We don't know from the get from the beginning which who is going to be in phase three or phase or or not. And even if they're both in phase three, it doesn't mean that they think it's a good idea, or one of them doesn't think it's a good idea to repair harm. Both both counselors involved, plus both people and there's support people need to think it's a good idea. If anyone doesn't think it's a good idea, it doesn't happen opening up that communication in phase three. But we don't know if um, from the get-go who's going to be able, to, we're, we're going to be opening up communication with or if we'll be opening up communication with the parties. Because we don't know if a guy is going to be able to move through to phase three. We don't know if he's not going to remain dangerous, which completely could be the case. So obviously we're not going to set up a conversation with a woman who's in phase three and able to repair harm when she's been hurt in a way that won't create more harm. We're not going to subject her to a guy who's in phase one, who's you know still being irresponsible and minimizing, denying, and blaming, and so forth. So we want to be clear about that. Um, the uh, So again, this idea that, they, that the process needs to be responsive to each individual case. But I do want to, in, just with regard to that, in terms of like the how fast can people move through the process, in the early days, we really had this idea that all the men were the same, but they were all high risk. They were all dying. They were all dangerous, and they were all not going to take responsibility and only want to power and control. And of course, do I work with those guys? Yes, that is a portion, uh, uh, albeit it's actually a small portion of the men that I work with, and you know that they are in phase one, and that some guys aren't amenable to change. That there's some personality disorders, some borderline personality disorders that aren't that amenable to change. And, you know, we're not going to put those guys in a phase three conversation. And at the same time, <clears throat> just over the years, we just learned that, you know, well, not the guys all aren't the same. So there's a lot of diversity with the guys that we actually talk with. Uh, and so if the, before, because we thought that all the guys were the same, we came, we thought they all needed to go through the same treatment, like the same group. And, you know, so if the guys were coming in, we thought they were all at A and they need to get to Z. We had thought they had to go through my 20 week group and then more stuff after that and more stuff after that before. I mean, we really didn't think about phase three in the early days. We were cynical that we'd even stop the violence. But anyway, um, 
but if a guy's going from A to Z, it's true. Some guys are coming in at A and they need to spend months and months and months before we'd even ever consider kind of a phase three option. Um, and at the, as I've just, we've learned that all the guys aren't the same. Some guys are coming in at M and some guys are coming in at W and they're ready and the partner's ready. They have ideas about, um, you know, repairing harm and relationship you know, they identify that this isn't, you know, like kind of chronic physical violence, which most of this field is just defined through. And that, uh, that uh, you know, part of it is just trying to get out of, you know, to support them. I mean, the reality is what happened in the early days. One, again, we didn't really even think phase three was a possibility. <clears throat> we were pretty cynical. I've just become much more hopeful over the years about what's possible. But... Um, the oh, sorry mm, i'm just editing myself with the short minutes i have left um how about i'm just gonna so that's a brief outline of phase one phase two phase three on this page you can see the breakdown of the different conversations and these are all in a manual if people are interested in having these uh, conversations with people to move through phase one move through phase two and move through phase three. I want to be clear, part of how repair is being defined, I'm really drawing on uh, Judith Lewis Herman's work really resonates with my own in terms of what do people who've been hurt actually want that would help actually repair the harm. And these are the four components that we're both preparing people for in phase two, and then we'll actually get communicated through phase three. It, part of it is acknowledging the details of the abuse, um, uh, and, you know, taking responsibility for that. So we're preparing guys to actually study, re talk about past incidents and so forth so that they are prepared to be able to hear about those incidents uh, from their partners if their partners want that acknowledgement and think that that's helpful. And again, it's often very powerful for women who have the opportunity to actually be in a room with a guy or, you know, through other, other means and actually hear from him that you weren't to blame for the abuse that I did to you. That I was wrong to do that. That no one deserves that. That is often very powerful for women who get to experience that from the guy who was blaming her. Because like for years we try, we, you know, as workers, we used to say for years that, you know, you're not to blame, you're not to blame. But to actually hear it from the guy who was blaming her is often very powerful for a lot of women. So that's part of the kind of conversations we're setting up there or creating a plan to stop abuse. So the guys would have a whole plan that they would share in terms of just the spotting the warning signs, what, what are the values they need to remind themselves if they can spot the escalation and so forth, acknowledging the effects of the abuse. And then, um, and we do a lot of work on that beforehand. So we, it's important for the guys to be putting themselves in their partner shoes. I mean, one of the features of abuse is, of course, that it's, uh, you know, the people who are perpetrating are generally self-absorbed. You know, they're wrapped up in their own pain. They're not thinking about the other and that that's part of what, you know, um, make, you know, allows the abuse to happen. So it makes sense. The opposite is true. Stopping the abuse involves one, engaging the guys in terms of what's important to them and who's important to them, but also looking at, um, you know, what are the effects on what's important to them. And then that is then helps prepare them for to hear the effects in phase three in not a way that's defensive or you don't need to feel that way or I didn't mean it or it's not that so be so sensitive. You know, all that stuff's going to be dried up because obviously all that stuff would create harm. So we're going to have that all attended to before we ever open up the communication between the parties. And then also about creating an accountability plan or a follow-up plan to address the effects. All with this idea of repairing harm without creating more harm. I just want to mention, it was mentioned earlier, just if people are interested in following this up, just an example for myself, I'll, um, I'll be interested in uh, uh, Leland's example. Uh, coming up. The example that I would refer people to is if people want to look up a better man online and or Anna Maria Tremonte did uh, one of her episodes on um, leaving paradise, I think, or something like that. You can look it up. Uh, she actually interviewed Atia and Atia spoke to her experience. So this is Atia uh, on the right and Steve on the left. And uh, Steve beat up 
um, Atia for two years. It was a terror situation. She escaped with her life. And uh, this was a documentary that Atia made. And the documentary got started with, she met Steve accidentally in Toronto, on the streets of Toronto. And she asked him, or she after she met him, she said to herself, if I ever see him again, I'm going to ask him if he'll allow me to videotape him and me for to interview him about our relationship in the intervening years that 20 years she joined the shelter movement she said terrible post-traumatic stress in terms of um uh you know not being able to sleep at night terrible insomnia always need a safety plan after every time she left the room uh or always not able to wear scarves always need never back to the you know to a wall in a restaurant and so forth <clears throat> so she gets this it, it so lo and behold they do meet up again and steve um says yes and so they go into this coffee shop this is a still from that first interview that they did and uh her friend is behind the camera shaking because uh, they're pretty nervous uh and so they have a two and a half hour conversation and you know atia thought it was you know powerful but she didn't know what to make of it because she had never talked to a guy who had used abuse before let alone the guy who almost killed her um and so she got a hold of me through some of the writing that i've done uh she had read and asked me if i would look at the kind of raw footage that they had and so part of what happened was um she um sent me the video and i could see that they were trying to have these kind of restorative conversations i mean he was getting he wasn't prepared well enough of course you know he wasn't prepared at all but uh but I mean, he had, you know, but he was, I could see what he was trying to do. He was trying to do the right by her. He was trying to repair what he could. He was getting swamped in his own shame. So he was focused more on himself than on caring for Atia, which is part of the preparation. But I could see in that she was looking for something from him in terms of her own repair. So I gave that feedback. And so part of what happened was they flew me back and forth from Toronto a few times, a number of times over quite a lengthy period and they made this documentary about that process so this documentary really highlights what's mostly in the documentary is phase three so it can be a little nerve-wracking i think for people in the field because they don't see phase one safety and they don't see the phase two the preparation that went into the conversation that's actually on video uh so i can appreciate people's nervousness but anyway just there was a phase one and a phase two that just didn't make the the uh chopping or you know get on the chopping block floor <clears throat> and so part of what happens here in this process is what it, steve begins to see is just the impact that his acknowledgement him no sure knowing it's not happening anymore his acknowledgement of the effects him hearing the details and part of his accountability is making the film that he he sees what it's doing for tia which is you know she begins to sleep for the first time in 20 years that she doesn't need a safety plan every time she leaves the house. That she, um, you know, doesn't need a, she can wear scarves again. She doesn't always have to have her back to the wall. And so through that process, both, you know, there's repair for Atia and restoration for Steve at the same time. Uh, so I invite you, if you're interested in that, you can look at that at, uh, you know, at on NFB, uh, just online. Um, and you can see how a T is really embraced through that process that she's not interested in creating more harm for Steve. She wants to repair the harm that happened to him, to her, you know, and, 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 and she's not interested in creating more harm through the process. So I do invite you to look at that. So I want to pass the torch over to you, Leland, in terms of uh, some examples of your work trafficking in um, this, um, Okay. Three. Thank you. Three phases. Okay. Um, well, Todd's <laughs> indicating here that the, the this sort of phase approach can really make visible uh, a path through and beyond the immediate effects of tra trauma and harm that you know prevent people from being able to respond to their circumstances as opposed to just reacting to them right from a place of you know nervous system dysregulation. So whether perpetrating harm or having been harmed, we want to be able to guide people in a non-shaming and a collaborative kind of way to understanding the impacts of traumatic stress on their body, 
on their ability to process strong emotion and their ability to think and make sense out of what happens to them. And that's all the parties involved, everyone involved in, in IPV. Um, I'm recalling uh, actually being at the Canadian Domestic Violence Conference in Toronto where Todd was on a panel discussing the release of the documentary, A Better Man. And somewhere in the panel discussion, um, Todd had said something to the effect of, men need to be empowered to take responsibility for their violence. And I, I had a fellow conference participant who I had been getting to know and had been sharing ideas with lean over and whisper to me, I'm not comfortable with that statement. And then later explained to me, you know, that men have held the power and abused power for too long. And so hence being not comfortable with this idea of empowering men. Um, I've sort of agonized over that um, and can, from my limited perspective, I think at least in principle, understand why empowering men can sound suspect in the context of IPV. Yet I find that many people from all genders uh, who have harmed others are often describing to me that in the moment that they're most obviously abusing power, they're actually feeling the most powerless. Um, you know, when someone is traumatized, their nervous systems are reacting constantly to an ongoing perception of threat. You know, they're, they're ping-ponging between the sort of states of hyper and hypo arousal and their ability to recognize their own agency and responsibly or reasonably respond compassionately to themselves and to others, it's greatly diminished. And they experience a kind of um, what I might call a trauma-induced fragility in which it becomes very difficult to recognize one's own choices, one's agency to make a difference. And, and very difficult then to use a person, you know, person's personal power in any kind of responsible way. So let me just give you an example of this. Let me introduce you to Stephen. Now this is a different Stephen actually than the Stephen in the Better Man documentary. Um, this Stephen is a male in his mid forties separated from his now ex-partner and children for about a year, they've been separated. Uh, after threatening his partner with a gun, with the kids present. So Stevens had no contact with the kids and, and his ex-partner for a year. There's a no contact order due to the severity of the, this, this threat that took place. And Stephen had been mandated by the courts to seek counseling and to work towards a co-parenting relationship because the partner wanted a divorce. And he, he came to me with the, um, the task of writing an apology letter to his children, who were 10 and 12 at the time, uh, who had themselves been in therapy because the event was very traumatizing for those kids. And Stephen was desperate to see his children again and stated that he was responsible for what happened and that he wanted to, you know, and intended to cooperate and that he was to blame. But when we'd sit down to talk, he would easily become defensive. He was always trying to correct what he saw as an unfair characterization of him as some kind of abusive monster. He really felt like he needed to correct that. And he stated that his mistake had cost him the love of his life, the dream he had for family. He'd stated he'd never been physically abusive before and, and explained to me that both he and his partner had been getting caught up in being verbally abusive to one another. Stephen admitted he was angry with his partner and, and was actually holding a gun, which he had been using earlier safely. Uh, it was actually a gun that was purchased uh, by his partner as a gift to him. And he said he never intended to give the impression that he would harm his partner or his kids. And he was angry and hurt that his partner uh, wasn't seeing that point of view. It seemed like nobody would believe him that this was the case. So Stephen was kind of additionally upset about not seeing his children for so long and, was, and felt like he wasn't being given any credit for the counseling he was doing, the programs he'd been attending and the work that he was trying to do to, to sort of get perspective and take some responsibility. And he felt that the child protection workers in the courts were treating him like he was about to become violent at any moment, which he thought was sort of unfair. And I wanna to return to that idea in a bit here. So he, his frustration grew more apparent when we began to work on his apology letter. The, the children's therapist was clear that um, the children were desperate to see their father too, but they were terrified that of him a little bit because from their point of view, they actually thought that he was gonna kill their mother in that incident. And the therapist, uh, I think, rightly suggested it'd be really helpful to acknowledge that harm in his apology letter, which I agreed with. But no matter how much I tried to explain this to Stephen, he refused to apologize and acknowledge to his children how they must have felt in the incident with the gun. Instead, he wanted to explain to his children that he would never or would never hurt or harm them or their mother. And he wanted to offer his explanations for the conflict that day and why they were in fact safe. 
When I asked Stephen if he felt it was important to validate his children's perspective, he simply stated he didn't want to give validity to the false claim that he was somehow capable of or intending to be violent. He stated that on that day of the event, he felt anything but powerful, anything but capable of planning to intentionally harm anyone. He stated that his partner was attacking him verbally and wouldn't stop and that he, he felt trapped and with nowhere to go. I asked Stephen, you know, what he would have to conclude if it turned out to be true, like I sort of gave him a hypothetical, what if it was true that you were capable, you don't think you're capable of harming your kids and your partner, but what if it's, what if it's, what if it's true that you have? And he stated that it would mean he'd be an unfit husband and father. And it would, and, 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 an un, and it was an unbearable idea for him under the circumstances that he would, that he would see himself as this unfit father and husband. And he, he stated he didn't want to be like his father, who he said he could never please and only ever made him feel like a failure which is a very interesting statement about his father. We'll return to that in a second too. So Stephen was eventually given access to his children, but he and his partner um, divorced despite their attempts to, his attempts to try and reconcile to her. Now, looking back on the case, I can see many ways that I would have operated differently had I had a better map of the train, so to speak. Like if I had then, if I'd had this sort of phase model, I think I could have done a better job. It was clear that Stephen was minimizing the harm that he had caused. And crossing the line between, you know, excusing his abuse and explaining it. It would have been easy for any therapist to see this as some kind of conspiracy that Stephen was promoting to avoid taking any responsibility at all. And instead of actually seeing him as someone who was suffering from past and present trauma and that needed to learn to be vulnerable again, to be able to respond and connect with himself and others rather than just reacting to try and protect himself emotionally from this horrible claim that he's this bad monster person, terrible father. So using the phase model, it, it, it's pretty clear now that Stephen was entering into therapy with the expectations from the agency that we were, that we're describing here as phase three, this apology letter. That's phase three, that's down the line. And yet right out of the gates, this is what he's required to do. And that despite this though, they were also speaking to him and treating him as though he was in phase one, as though he was literally about to reoffend again. So this was confusing for Stephen, and I think rightly so. And Stephen wasn't ready for phase three. He was still reacting from a place of traumatic stress. I was witnessing it happen in my office. And he had not yet done the work to understand the historical context um, of the abuse that he engaged in with his partner, nor was he able to discuss his ideas about gender and the gender roles in his relationship and why there was conflict in his relationship to begin with. And instead of understanding the context of his own trauma and that of his partner and his kids, he was reacting from shame and fear, fragile, defensive, unable to cope with his own emotions, unable to recognize his own agency, the agency that he actually needed to begin to live up to his own values and begin to repair and recover from all the trauma of the event. Another way of stating this is that Stephen was kind of blind to his own agency. He couldn't see that he actually did have choices. Even in the, 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 the day of the event itself, in the event itself, he had choices that, weren't, that he couldn't recognize or see. And that um, there, there, there could have been different paths that he could have taken. He, he could only focus on clarifying his intentions and couldn't explore the impact of his behavior. He, he only wanted to focus on his good intentions and not the impact on his partner and his kids. So how do I make sense out of this now? I mean, what I kind of am seeing, and you know, I'm still formulating these thoughts, but that trauma can give rise to a kind of fragility, an inability to cope. And when there's that fragility present, there's no perception that, from the person that they have any agency or power at all, which is kind of ironic. You know, we say like, you know, Stephen's abusing his power, but he doesn't feel like he's abusing power. He doesn't feel like he has any power at all. Um, so we want to move from this place of fragility where there's no perception of agency and the irresponsible use of power to a grounded place where a person can recognize their agency respond to a situation responsibly, be actually vulnerable. And, and I'm contrasting here on purpose, the idea of fragility and vulnerability. We want the vulnerability, but the fragility is problematic. There's no agency in the fragility, whereas vulnerability, there can still be agency. And so therefore there can be a responsible use of power. So using the phase approach, I could have more easily, I think, recognized that Stephen initially needed to be able to ground himself when he became triggered. 
And he, you know, by the shame and the fear and the pain of losing his partner and his kids, which you could understand was immense. He didn't see them for a year. I put my, putting myself in his shoes, even if I had made his mistake, it would have been unbearable to be apart from my child that long. And only Stephen could successfully understand and attend to the physiological impacts of trauma and ground himself um, and be able to understand the, the gendered context of his conflictual marriage and possibly the links to his previous trauma he had with his father. Even though he did discuss his father with me, I mostly missed an opportunity to connect that his experience with his father might be connected to the conflict with his wife. And my impression in retrospect, and this has you know, become true in many other cases that I've worked with, is that Stephen was confusing the past with the present at times with his partner. And he was reacting to the, her as though he was being treated, as though she was treating him like he was treated by his father. And this was, I think, keeping him from seeing that he was engaged in abusive behavior. Uh, he, did, he saw himself as a victim defending himself from his partner's attacks, but actually he was, you know, himself creating harm, perpetrating abuse. Um, so from a place of nervous system grounding and clarity on his values and relationship and insight into how the ongoing impacts of past trauma and present trauma were distracting him from his values and from the harm that had been created, I suspect Stephen wouldn't have experienced writing his apology letter so negatively if he had been through, you know, guided correctly. He could have been empowered actually to see into the past, uh, into his own shame and pain and been able to tolerate thinking about the harm that he had caused other, about the impacts of harm. He could have not only apologized, but actually gone further to make real moves to effectively repair the harm that was done both to his kids and his partner and sort of recommit to his values for family, even if the relationship didn't continue. So there's an example of, you know, um, where well, I feel I could have done a better job and where the, the sort of phase approach provides a kind of map that helps you kind of locate where you are working with these complex situ cases. Um, um, so, uh, I, you know, I'll end there. Um, we're going to open up now for some questions um, or comments if anyone has any. And maybe even there's an opportunity here for Todd and I to just exchange some ideas if there's something arising for Todd as I was speaking. Uh, in terms of clarifying this phase is a little more. Well, there's lots there that I want to respond to, but I want to hear from other people first. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm back on your screen to help moderate. Um, so folks who joined us today, do we have any any questions for, for Todd and, and Leland? I'll, you know, maybe as folks are, are thinking about what they might want to submit as a question, I'll just say thank you to, to you both. Um, I'm kind of reeling, I guess, from thinking about just how, how difficult uh, it must be to try to create this space of, um, as Todd said, con confrontational safety. Um, that's very interesting. I, I was also really interested to hear about uh, how developing this phase model really involved rethinking um, some assumptions that have kind of traditionally maybe been, been part of how we think of IPD and that are still very powerful. Like the idea that all men are the same and all men are high risk, I think is not only an idea in the past, but it still has a lot of currency. Uh, so a very, very thought provoking um, conversation and thank you both. I'm, I'm looking at my questions here. Oh, and I see that we have one uh, from Kathy. So I'll read Kathy's first and then I see some others filling in. Uh, so Kathy asks, will this approach work with people who are mandated into programs because of their violent behaviors? Any thoughts? Most of the men that we work with are mandated to be there. We are one of those programs. So they're either mandated through probation or child protection or both. I mean, because Bridges has been around for so long. We actually do have quite a few guys who are like refer on their nephews or their uncles or whatever to come into the program. So we do actually have a number of voluntary clients too, but the basis of our work is mandated clients. And Todd, really, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if you go. Well, well I was just going to say that uh, I don't know if you would see this as sort of true, but I feel like the, the men that are mandated 
sometimes are better even suited. I find that people that are sort of self-referring already have ideas, often good ideas, you know, about what they want from the process. And, you know, often it is to be accountable and take responsibility and repair harm. But sometimes with the mandated men, I find that they're um, more amenable to what we're bringing uh, in terms of the process. So it, it, does, it works just fine with people who are sort of being, in, in a sense, mandated or forced into to a program. Thank you both. Uh, we also have a question from Dolores. Uh, so Dolores asks, would you agree, either of you, would you agree with the statement that there is a lack of programming for men designed by men to address this topic? And if, if so, if yes, why does this gap in services exist? Uh, that's a great question, yes. Good definitely, question. Definitely a lack of services. I mean, we've, we've been working there's a research project we're doing out of Dal uh, that's being funded by the federal government on this safety and repair groups across Atlanta, Canada. And it's really revealed how underfunded these programs are and how thin they are on the ground in terms of actually just trying to get, uh, you know, ally, uh, you know, people as part of that research. Um, and why do I think that is? I, here, here's, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's multiple reasons. Here's two, I think is that um, I think, you know, I think like me many years ago, uh, the field doesn't think men can change and that they actually see it as supports for men versus supports for women. And so, I mean, I, it just that formula of like trying to stop men's violence against women by just sheltering women and not actually stopping the men's violence against, like it just, it doesn't make sense to me that those two things are working opposite each other. You know, if you, but it does, it is premised on the idea that you have to believe the men can change, uh, you know, and that, 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 that's why you would put resources into that because that would actually stop the violence against the women. But, uh, and also I just think that there's a punitive sensibility that still exists to that the best way is actually I think part of my own oppositional engagement with the men the confrontation really came out of that punitive sense of justice and I think that that still persists so I think it just leaves these opportunities which women are asking for they've always asked for they're they've been participating couples participate in phase three at home by themselves and for years we used to just say okay we can't help you with that it's too dangerous meanwhile we just left it to them to work it out themselves which you know some of them did but we just over the years we got the fact that oh well maybe we could help them maybe we could actually help the couples who uh, you know for whom it could be a possibility rather than just leaving it for them to figure out how to repair harm themselves I was going to say at Dal here, Todd, you know, we, we just rolled out this uh, program called Man Made that was done by a company called ANOVA out of Western University. And it's, uh, you know, it's about consent and it's meant to educate men on that, those topics here on campus where, you know, not a week goes by as a therapist, but I don't talk with someone who's been sexually assaulted or harassed. I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a serious problem on campus. And yet there really is no resources. And I was literally just before popping into this meeting, I was in a meeting discussing how we're going to follow up in attending to the men who are respondents of internal investigations around assault on campus. It, it, there's nothing there right now. There's everything in place for, um, for people who have been harmed, but nothing for those who have harmed. They go through this investigative process where they're extremely afraid. Um, you know, I've now heard from several different men who've gone through that process that they they kind of wanted to take responsibility and understand what their mistake was, but didn't in that process feel entirely free or safe to be able to talk about everything. And there needs to be that space. So we're working on trying to create that here on campus. So, um, and I, I think the reason why there isn't anything yet is precisely the reason that you've given Todd, right? Is that it's just been thought that that there's a competition between resources that, that, that really is, I think, may, made women in, in a sense, maybe more dangerous uh, or more at risk on campus. Yeah. Folks, we have to, I time, I hope, for one more quick question because we do have one that Tanya has just submitted. Uh, so Tanya asks, are there any specific strategies employed in mm. phase one? to help an individual recognize the harm their behavior caused, such as narrative approaches or, or others? 
For sure. I mean, part of this, <clears throat> I mean, you know, there's a whole training and process. If people are interested, I think the link is online line, and there's a manual to go with all this process. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really quite well documented if people are, want to follow up in more detail, but just in terms of initially the, the first phase of the work really is uh, inviting men to talk about what's important to them and what they care about and what they want in terms of their relationships with their kids, with their partners, with their homes, all of which the men have not spent much time thinking about. You know, usually they define their responsibilities in terms responsibilities is, you know, in terms of, you know, making money and maybe disciplining the kids. And then everything else relationship wise, you know, it's just for her to think about. Uh, so a big part of it is actually them articulating that. And then as they as they come to get that we get that there's more to them than their violence, that they may also be men who want caring, responsible, caring, loving relationships at the same time, they may want power and control. They also want caring, loving relationships as they get, as they come to understand that we get that there's more to them than just the violence. Then they begin to be willing to look at the violence and the effects it's had on their partners. Cause they get that, that they get how that going down that path will actually help them stop the violence and repair the harm. So there's lots. And the, I mean, part of it is allowing men to actually explore their own experiences of violence and recognizing that those experiences might be helpful in acknowledging what their kids' experiences of violence was, what their partner's experience of violence of, that maybe the men even have, you know, similar experiences in their past that we can draw on, not as a means, not at all as a means of excusing the abuse in the present and as a means of taking responsibility to understand the effects so that they be better able to uh, repair the harm that they've done. Yeah. thought it would maybe be all right to pair that insight with exploring values and what's important to men with also attending to the actual physiological effects of trauma. This also happens in phase one where, um, you know, I sort of think of it this way that the connecting men with their values is sort of top down because that requires thinking and its ideas. And then there's this sort of bottom up, you know, attending to the physiological, the nervous system part when men get, when anyone, when people get activated, uh, when they get triggered, you know, because of shame and pain and, and fear when they're across from you, that you can't reason with them very well. So there has to be this recognition in that first phase that creating safety means actually helping someone recognize when they're getting triggered, when they're getting activated in their nervous system and helping them ground again so that they can actually think clearly. You can't think when you're in hyper and hypo arousal. So those two pieces, that bottom up and that top down work really nicely in phase one to ground the person and prepare them for the the deeper exploration that takes place in phase two. Thank you so much. I think I'll yep. turn it back over to Denise. Yeah. Okay. My goodness. Thank you very much. Um, I, Todd, I will have some questions for you, some follow-up questions for you by email about the, the doof right. model. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentations. It was very, um, you know, it's it's interesting to start that that we are starting to look at you know different ways of looking at family violence and how we can address it. Um, but so we will close off this session for today. But what before we do, um, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that this year is the Mural McQueen Ferguson Center's 30th anniversary in conducting community-based, action-oriented family violence research. Yes, Fantastic. 30 years. Yeah. And uh, so hosting these events like these webinars uh, and managing our research projects against uh, across the Maritimes uh, and building community relationships to do all this work uh, wouldn't be possible without the contributions of the Ferguson Foundation. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite Noreen Bonell from the Ferguson Foundation to say a few words in closing remarks. And I'm gonna share my that little slide here. There, share that. And Noreen, are you? Where is Noreen? There. I'm here. You're here. Yeah. <laughs> I I unmuted and began my video. There you go. This after this, this presentation, oh, I'll, I'll start. Um, as I was going through this presentation, I was absolutely spellbound by all the examples and the empathy, along with the knowledge and awareness of our two presenters. Um. If those who had started the Ferguson Foundation way back in the mid 80s 
were here today, I, I, I think they would be, uh, and, and hearing this, and there are some of them, of course, still still here with us. They, uh, they I don't know at that time that they would have realized uh, that these webinars and the people who are doing all the research and would all make this connection together to be able to spread the word, spread this, spread this knowledge, spread this awareness. Um, it, it's it's absolutely incredible. The the Ferguson Foundation began with the idea of helping make be people be aware and educated and have action about the family violence and what what was what needed to be done and at the beginning they they, they didn't just didn't have any any uh, any pull or any push or any true foundation until for all they wanted to do until they had this vision of the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research. And when that happened just over 30 years ago, action really started to happen. And the public, uh, the university levels, the public and government levels started to hear knowledgeable information. And that information is not always knowledgeable uh, about, about family violence family violence, that how real it was and what needed to be done. So that all that has happened throughout the these these 30 years. And and the impact is definitely seen in many areas. The the important work of the foundation in the research, in the community outreach, along with informing government areas where where there is power to fund and get and be able to um really work with with organizations is, is is so is so important along with you know our public supporting uh foundations like ours so that we can then reach out and help other other area other groups as well just recently we had the the uh 30th uh award ceremony it's an annual annual ceremony to award someone or sometimes an organization who has done phenomenal work in this area. And Deborah Westerberg uh, was honored for her, her lifetime of work. This is always happens at government house here. The Lieutenant governor is a patron. It is a wonderful acknowledgement of so much that has been done and will be done. And our two presenters today, Todd and Leland, Absolutely wonderful. I was, I, I just feel that more people need to hear you than is than we're just on this webinar. That then I uh, hopefully you will be an item that will be able to. I know you've done various things in the area or you're in the physical area, the geographical area, maybe in other research areas, but uh, and and practical areas. But I really believe lots more people need to hear this over and over again. Um, I'm, I made notes because I don't always talk off the cuff. Um, I mean, I feel that words like cynical to hopeful were really powerful. That, you know, we talk about caring and loving relationships. That, you know, they have real process and progress from early days. About safety and preparing and practicing. I love the model that you used. That... Uh, you know that this is action oriented, but you know, quotes like trauma gives rise to a fragility. Um, the the uh, just making us more aware of that uh, Anna Maria Tremonti uh, documentary, all of that, and and your experiences and sharing the experiences. I would like to thank you on behalf of of the foundation and also the center, since I was asked to do the thanking. I want to uh, compliment you on your incredible work and your dedication that came through in this presentation. The examples you gave and um, the, I guess, making us all think of relationships and how fragile they can be at times even in moments or perhaps in longer 
and, and in longer times too, months and years. So um, thank you both very, very much. Thank you to, to the center the, and the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center too for arranging these webinars in this month, particularly. I look forward to them every year. And uh, I'm very happy that I was here. I was being, I was asked to say a few words at the end of this one. Todd and Leland, you're doing amazing work. And uh, may you continue long and feel, feel all those successes. Little can be big. So thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you very Nori. much. Noreen, we always look forward to your closing remarks or your remarks. Thank you very much. That was great. <laughs> so I think uh, we're at 1.02 p.m. So uh, we'll let everyone go back to work <laughs> after the lunch hour for those who are in uh, in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for- Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Stay in yeah. touch. Thank you for having us. Yep. Bye, Bye now.